Ladies and gentlemen, may I uh, have your attention, please? And uh, may I ask you to return to your seats as we will be resuming our conference. And uh, we have uh, we have two two activities uh, after this uh, break. So uh, the first is uh, speech, and the second one a um, uh, brief panel discussion. Uh, and um, I um, I'm really thrilled to give floor to. Uh, a long-standing friend of the Re uh, Graduate School of Law, uh, who also somehow happens to be uh, with the uh, European Court of Justice. Uh, and that is uh, our honorary professor, uh, Eleanor Sharpstone. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. As you, as you so nicely put it, I am uh, at the moment on loan to the court in Luxembourg. Uh, it is a very great pleasure, however, to be back here in Riga and as your honorary professor, something I'm very honored by, you're the only people who've been kind enough to give me that title. My home university hasn't done that. So as somebody whom you have given that honor to, it is, of course, a great pleasure for me to be here for this birthday party, although I didn't come with a plate. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> now, my challenge is going to be to try to show how what I want to talk about actually relates in the slightest to what we've been hearing so far. Uh, but I'm going to suggest to you that it does, because when we talk about litigating before the Court of Justice of the European Union, it is necessary at once to show the traditional skills of the lawyer and also to show an openness of mind which links across very nicely with what we've been hearing about in terms of interdisciplinary work, looking at how law combines with technology, combines with diplomacy and, and so on. So let me make a bold statement to start with has the advantage of being a short sentence, which I love, in English anyway. Lawyers litigate, full stop. Sooner or later, most lawyers do in fact find they are litigating. Even lawyers whose professional practice is mainly advisory work, who don't really sort of fancy themselves in the brawl of the courtroom. Sooner or later, ladies and gentlemen, sooner or later, there's the deal that goes bad. Or there is the unexpected investigation of your client by the authorities. And that results in an adverse decision, perhaps a financial sanction as well, and that may need to be challenged on the client's behalf. And if the surrounding circumstances involve the application of EU law, and that's often the case, you know, if you look under the national law and you scratch a bit, you find there were some EU law provisions which, in fact, underpin the law that is being applied. Well, in those circumstances, the litigation journey that the lawyer will be taking on behalf of the client may, at some stage, pass through Luxembourg, which is where the Court of Justice of the European Union is based. And when I say Court of Justice of the European Union, we're, we now have a nomenclature problem because we have an institution called the Court of Justice of the European Union. But within that institution, we have two jurisdictions. We have, very confusingly, the Court of Justice of the European Union. Who did that? I mean, it should have a different name. The Court, the Court of Justice, let's call it. In English, we tend to call it the ECJ, which is clear, but actually has no source whatsoever in the treaties. We have the Court of Justice, and we have what used to be called the Court of First Instance, which seemed perfectly logical, because it was the court which was below the Court of Justice. But it got rechristened, and it became, in English, the General Court. So let's look very, very briefly at how 
the lawyer is going to find him or herself in front of either of those courts. Court of justice, first of all, then. Well, unless you're doing government work, you will probably meet the Court of Justice through the reference procedure under Article 267 TFEU. That is, unless you have an appeal from the General Court, but that's kind of obvious, isn't it? So, the parameters to that reference procedure, well, first of all, rather disconcertingly, for most lawyers anyway, you're not really going to be doing anything at all with the facts. The facts are the facts that were found by the National Court. You may think the National Court got it wrong. You may think the National Court should have found lots of other facts which would help your client, but you are stuck with the facts as recorded in the order for reference. You can certainly hint to the court that there may be some other matters that will need to be looked at once the case goes back to the National Court, but you cannot invite the Court of Justice to find lots of facts. And for that reason, you're not doing any of the things that lawyers do as their bread and butter in a national court. You're not adducing evidence. You're not examining witnesses, spoken like a true common lawyer. You know, you're not doing any of that. The order for reference is what frames the proceedings. Having said that, the court has a slight habit of sometimes going a bit wider. Now, the good news, if you're a national lawyer and you're ambitious, is that usually, usually, really, really usually, if there's a case in the national court and the national judge makes a reference and there is a stage in the case which therefore takes place before the court in Luxembourg, the Court of Justice, you, the national lawyer, get to follow the case. And this is great and it looks wonderful on your CV, uh, but it also means that many, many people who are pleading in front of the Court of Justice are first-timers. They haven't done it before. And for some of them, indeed, it may be the one and only time that they plead in front of the court in which I serve. Now, we don't expect you to do it blind. There are some rules of procedure. There's even some guidance for counsel, as well as the guidance for national courts, which are sitting there on the website. And you do well to read that because if you read it, you discover, uh, and this, uh, this is something which disconcerts many lawyers, you discover that, for example, there are very strict time limits for lodging written observations. We're not nice and cuddly, we're not flexible. If you have written observations to put in front of the court, you have a period of two months and 10 days from the moment when the order for reference was notified to you. You may wonder why the 10 days. I have to tell you it is one of the splendid, splendid illogicalities, ridiculous illogicalities of the system. That in the old days, there used to be different distances that were added on to those two months to reflect the different distances from Luxembourg that the lawyer might be, and therefore the time that it would take, well, an old-fashioned letter or indeed perhaps a carrier pigeon to get from where the lawyer was to Luxembourg. And then, as our previous speaker was explaining, you know, technology moves on. Now, of course, there were, there were, there were fax machines, first of all, great innovation. And, and then there was email, gosh. And so the, you know, the 10 days actually is completely ridiculous. You do not need a 10-day extension. But we were hearing before that lawyers are conservative people, and certainly the way we all work, most of the work gets done in those 10 days. Because you know there's two months, and that's great, but you need to consult with the client. If you're doing government work, you need to liaise with the government. And somehow, inevitably, inexorably, you get to the end of the two months and you still haven't got the text. And then you go into the 10-day period and finally, on the last day of the 10 days, you, know, you manage to get the facts off and then you send the written text to confirm it and it's all fine. And so when we tried, we, the court, tried to abolish the 10 days, there was a howl of protest from lawyers representing member states, you can't do that, you mustn't do that. We don't care that it's illogical to have those 10 days in there. We need the 10 days. So you have, 
Ladies and gentlemen, two months and 10 days, but you don't have 11 days. Please be careful. Court of Justice, therefore, general type of action you will have will be the reference procedure under Article 267. In the general court, it isn't like that. In the general court, quintessentially, you are challenging an adverse decision. Now, that can be an adverse decision on a company client that has been being a little naughty with the competition rules. It might be something to do with the decision of the chemicals agency with REACH. It might be, of course, that lovely subject which we're all passionate about, trademarks. Yes. Uh, it might be that you have a client who has found himself suspected, falsely of course, of some involvement in terrorist activities and he has had his assets frozen because his name has been put on the list and so on. You have a decision that you're challenging and as soon as you say decision challenging, you say okay, some fairly obvious things that flow from that. Admissibility, is my, is my action going to be admissible? Does my client have like a stand eye to challenge this? There's Time limit, again a strict time limit for challenging the decision. Very importantly, it is the practitioner speaking to you. It's the whole issue of framing your case. As soon as you are taking the case to the court, you, in the way that you frame your challenge to that decision, you are setting the parameters of what the court is going to be looking at. And the court's not going to look at the case a different way up because halfway through, you suddenly realise that it might be nice to have brought in an extra point. You are framing it, and yet that first document will determine how the court is going to approach the issues and what it's going to look at. And again, OK, you will find the necessary material. It's sitting there in the rules of procedure, and it's sitting there on the website. That was all the same the sense I needed to say now about the differences between the two jurisdictions, because... What I'm going to move on to are points which are observations which I truly believe are common to both jurisdictions, both the General Court and the Court of Justice itself. So, dissecting my title, what's the same about litigating before these courts in Luxembourg? What's the same as what you're used to? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that what makes for good, sensible litigation is a constant. Doing the lawyer's job properly is actually, it's actually the same. You need to use your procedure efficiently and economically, and you need to take advantage of the procedure if there's something in there that can help you. You have to look after the client's interests, obviously. Helping the court and being respectful towards the court, by the way, are also in there. Because no, nobody is going to get the court on their side by projecting the case to the court in a way which is aggressive and disrespectful. I know we wear fancy robes and we sit up there on the bench, but actually we're human beings and... We try not to take a dislike to you, but some lawyers sometimes put a case in the way you think, I wish that client had not got that lawyer because I have got to disregard the way that lawyer is conducting the case and try to see if the lawyer, lawyer's client actually has a good case, which is not being assisted by the lawyer. So please, being helpful to the court, being respectful towards the court, are in there and they're important. Marshalling all the necessary and relevant information. Sounds crazy. Why am I saying this to you? Of course that's what you do if you're arguing a case. I wish I could say it of course happens in my court because it doesn't. People turn up every week and they haven't checked some very basic fact which it is blindingly obvious that somebody, probably that tedious woman Sharpston as Advocate General, is going to ask them about. So marshal the necessary and relevant information, get it in. Be prepared to answer the court's questions. Being reliable and trustworthy as counsel is, I think, very important if you are going to be a repeat customer of the court because you don't want to turn up arguing a case for your sixth client 
and have the thought saying to itself, oh no, we've got so-and-so again. Yes, well, we will we'll disregard what they tell us and we'll have a look at the case and see if we can understand what's going on. Above all, I'm going to suggest, but this is true in the National Court as well, you need focused advocacy. This is not about picking up a machine gun and you know, firing bursts at random, hoping that with a bit of luck, one of the bullets is going to hit the target. Maybe with a helping hand from somebody in the court who sees that you almost got the target, but not quite, and sort of bends the bullet so that, in fact, it comes round. That is your job as counsel to make sure that the advocacy is focused and that it deals with the essential issues. All right, there had to be a second aspect of this, didn't there? That was what was similar. What about what's different? Well, I'm going to suggest that there are two aspects here that really one needs to focus on. One is the fact that the environment is a multilingual environment. The other is that it's an environment of multiple legal cultures. Let's begin with the multilingualism. I think that litigating in a multilingual environment is a bit like repairing a watch wearing a pair of really thick gloves. You can do it. You can do it very successfully. But you really have to be aware of the fact that what you are generating in your head as the pleading and what is going to come out the far end through the linguistic frontier, over the frontier, through the linguistic transformation, are not necessarily the same thing. And hence my analogy with wearing gloves. There is an effect, first of all, on the written pleadings. There's an effect on the length, on making sure that they're clear, on what you use in annexes. Please be aware of a booby trap. In my court, annexes are not automatically translated. In a national court, if you have a pleading and you want to annex five very useful additional documents, you put them in and you say general point and then you say see annex one. Please be aware, we have enough trouble managing to translate the core documents that are lodged. The translation services of the court at the moment, between what they're translating that's coming in, and they're translating that into our common working language, which, by the way, is French, not English, and then the documents that are translated out again into the 24 languages of the European Union. The global figure for translation every year at the moment is running at about 1,200,000 pages. That's an awful lot of translation. And we only keep it down to that by having very strict rules that we do not automatically translate everything that gets put in. So if you are producing a written pleading, you have to flag up for the court that there is something absolutely vital at pages 27 to 29 of Annex 13. If you do that, there is some chance that somebody is going to dig that out. I'm going to let you into a little secret. How do we work around the fact that we don't translate anything, everything? Answer, if I know that there's something in Annex 13 that might be useful, and Annex 13 is in, yes, for example, Latvian, I will ask one of the lawyers who's working with me to go down the corridor and have a chat with a colleague who is working with the Latvian judge. And that chat will be that my lawyer says to the Latvian judge's lawyer, we're looking for point, this particular point. We think from the main pleading that there may be something in Annex 13 at these pages. Can we have a look at it together? Certainly, says the nice Latvian lawyer. And um, they sit down together with a highlighter pen. And if there is indeed in Annex 13 some passages that are useful, 
the Latvian colleague will mark in the margin with a highlighter pen, these are the core bits you actually need, and those bits will then be translated, but not 50 pages of annex. Now, what I've described to you is a system which has no safety net, so if you would like us to look at Annex 13, please note you better tell us that that's where we should be looking. But at least the written pleadings are being translated by lawyer linguists who are dual qualified, who are both lawyers and linguists, and who do a very good job, right? That is the written pleadings. Now let's think about the effect on the oral advocacy. And that effect is very striking indeed. Let me tell you what happens quite often and what is almost entirely useless. Let us imagine a lawyer who hasn't been in the court before, so he's very excited at coming to this big, big moment in his professional career. He's also, of course, very nervous. And he realises that he put some material into the written pleadings, but lots of other things he needs to say. He is then disconcerted to be told by the court that he's only got 15 minutes. Never mind. I can write, I can write a speech that deals with all of this. And so he sits down and he constructs a very, very detailed, complex, complicated, in fact, effectively, an additional written pleading. It's very elaborate. The sentence structure is Byzantine. And he knows that, in fact, that pleading can't be done in 15 minutes. You might do it in 25 minutes if you were going at a reasonable speed. Then he arrives in Luxembourg and he walks into the main courtroom because, you know, it was a big case. He looks round and it's a sort of double banked interpreter's booth. By now he is seriously panicking. And he is invited backstage by the president of the court just before the hearing. And there's a roll call. So the president will, will look and say, and uh, you are appearing on behalf of the plaintiff, Mr. whatever. Uh, you said you need 15 minutes. And this is where he makes his fatal mistake. He thinks I can. I can get some brownie points off the court by, by saying I won't really need 15 minutes, I'll, I'll only need 10 minutes. So he says, I'll only need 10 minutes, or well, actually perhaps 12, my lord, but I, I, I won't need 15. So we now have a text which would take 25 minutes, and he's just engaged that he was going to do it in 12 minutes. And everyone goes back outside, and the court comes in and sits, and the president beckons him forward. And at that stage, well, the first thing that usually happens is he doesn't adjust the microphone. So the microphone is up there somewhere, and as you can see, it's not much use up there. Because the interpreters can't hear you if you aren't speaking into the microphone. But the usher comes across and adjusts the microphone, and then he puts his head down into the script... And he reads at lightning speed in a dead monotone with his eye on his watch or his iPhone, which he's put in front of him, to try to get this done within the time limit. And I have to tell you that the effect of this advocacy is very closely approaching zero. It makes no impact on anyone in the court who actually knows the language being spoken. And if you don't know the language that is being spoken, your only hope is the interpreters. Now, the interpreters are not mind readers. They are brilliant simultaneous interpreters. They are very, very good. By the way, they aren't lawyers. They are interpreters. And for many language combinations, the interpretation is not happening direct from the source language into the language that the judge or advocate general is listening to. And that is because there are certain language combinations which you are very unlikely to find an interpreter possessing unless he or she happens to have a family member with that language. I mean, let's take the example of Finnish into Greek, all right? As far as I know, none of our Greek interpreters speak Finnish, and that's because none of them have a Finnish mama. 
So what happens then is that the interpretation goes through a pivot language. And you can readily imagine that some of what is being said by the original speaker gets lost on the first leg of that interpretation, and the second part of what was being said gets lost on the second leg. I think I've, I think I've made the point. Let's move from there to the multiple legal cultures. And here I would simply say to you, beware the unspoken assumption. Let me explain what I mean by that. When we're talking national law to each other, we've come from the same legal culture, we've got the same background, we train the same way. We speak in shorthand. We discuss the core issue as we have defined it, but we discuss that against the background of a lot of shared matters, which, which we, we never bothered to visit. We have the shared common assumptions, and therefore what we do, you know, quasi-automatically, we only speak about what is contentious as between the parties. And that works fine, provided as an English common law lawyer, I'm talking with an English common law lawyer. It doesn't work fine as a guaranteed system if we're talking as between lawyers who are professional lawyers, but who come from different traditions. If we come from different traditions, then unless you state the starting point and the premises, the surrounding premises, clearly, you may find that you come unstuck. And this is what indeed does sometimes happen. We have discussions as between colleagues at the court I might have a situation where a reporting judge whom I very often work with and, you know, very reasonable chap, no problem at all, and then suddenly on a particular case, I cannot understand what's got into him. You know, he's, for some reason, he seems to have the entire case upside down, and it's very unusual because he, you know, he's normally very reliable. When the, He's probably saying exactly the same about me, by the way. At least I hope he's saying I'm normally reliable. He's certainly saying the other bit. What usually happens, when you, if you try to unpack what has gone wrong, what you find is that neither of you stated the surrounding assumptions. And what has in fact happened is that I have assumed white. His referendaire, the lawyer working with him, has assumed black. He has assumed gray. Oh, who knows, maybe yellow. In other words, we aren't starting from the same place. And it takes a lot of gentle effort, not to mention humility, to go back from that to get to a shared understanding of what the case is actually about so that you can then take it forward and deal with it. Now, I'm going to bring this to, to a close by making a statement and telling a short story. And it is a short story, I promise, those who are watching the time. I'm going to say that if you are an effective lit litigator before your national court, you can be equally effective before the Court of Justice and or the General Court. But in order <clears throat> to be effective, you do have to adjust to the environment in which you will be pleading. And in order to do that, you need this very same openness of mind that you need to be successful in doing interdisciplinary work. It's not magic, you need that openness of mind. Now, as a former English and Irish barrister, I'm of course very proud of the good reputation that the bar has before the court. I'm going to finish with a cautionary tale. I hope it will also amuse. It was an occasion when I was working as a referendaire and as a lawyer working with a British member of the court, and I was in court. My judge I was working for, Sir Gordon Slynn, was the reporting judge, and a member of the English bar got it totally, totally wrong. The case, I'll protect the barrister by not identifying it by name, 
The case was about dairy quotas, about milk quotas. And the barrister had made the main pleading. There he is, resplendent, you know, wig, stiff collar, gown, very dignified. He's made his main pleading. And Sir Gordon Slynn, as usual, as customary for an English judge, is asking counsel some questions. And they're getting along beautifully. In fact, they've both forgotten that they're not in the High Court in London. <laughs> so Gordon is asking questions, and the barrister is answering. Yes, but Mr. Smith, you know, what about this? Well, my lord. And Gordon asks the final question, and the barrister gives an answer. And then, alas, the barrister says to himself, I, I can improve on that answer. I can, I, can, I can show how clever I am and just, just round it off nicely. And so having given the answer, which is that the same rule that applies to this should apply to that, he smiles ingratiatingly at Sir Gordon and he says, Indeed, my lord, one might say, my lord, that what is source for the goose is source for the gander, my lord. And, I mean, Gordon smiles, and everyone else is just sitting there with their earpiece, like so, and they're waiting for the interpretation of the final <laughs> submission. And they sit there, and they wait, and all, all the interpretation channels have fallen silent. Because all the interpreters are thinking furiously to themselves, what the hell was that? <laughs> and, and, and how do I interpret it? I mean, I, he was talking about milk a moment ago. Ah, what, we, what is this? The situation was saved, and saved brilliantly, by the French interpreter. The, the French are sort of the senior partners in this game, you understand. And this was an extremely experienced interpreter. Years and years of faithful service. And she was not amused. <laughs> she leant forward. She punched the button on the microphone with a degree of viciousness that I have rarely seen. And in a voice that was about... 20 degrees below absolute zero. She said, I'll give it you in French first and then in translation. She said, Il vient de raconter une blague sur la volaille. <laughs> he has just made a joke about poultry. <laughs> now, it was absolutely brilliant. Why? Well, because just like you, everyone laughed. And the, the barrister was was happy, you know, that's all fine, they enjoyed my, they, they enjoyed my final submission, jolly good, you know. And of course we were laughing at him, you know, what a prat, what, what a complete idiot. How did he think that that was going to help the case in the least? So please, pas de blague sur la volée. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>